It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be anywhere after two years of COVID. So it is good to see and all the people that I haven't seen or those of you I have seen in your pajamas um, from Zooms. We have Zoomed ourselves to death on uh, various and sundry um, workshops over time. My name is Joyce Thomas, and I'm going to try to get comfortable here with all of you since it's a small group. And so those of you who are far away, you can feel free to come forward. We really want this to be as interactive as we can. You know, it's very important to uh, acknowledge all individuals who've contributed to this field. And I was very happy when um, APSAC allowed me to um, really kind of talk about the history of the people, particularly African Americans, who've been making a tremendous input to this field through the scientific work, through their research, through their practice. But sometimes as time goes by, and really a, a comfortable 35 years have gone by uh, since I've been in the field, and probably more than that, um, we get new people in the field, we get new individuals, and sometimes we don't always pay attention to what went on before us because we're so engrossed in what we're doing for ourselves today. So it's with that in mind that I'm gonna talk about and celebrate, really celebrate African Americans who were pioneers in this field. And hopefully over the period of time, I'll be able to share with you my various and sundry experiences and all of the various kinds of programs and activities that I have been involved in directly. What I'd like to accomplish today really is to just focus our attention and foster discussion. So please take notes and, um, or remember questions because there's so many outstanding uh, individuals who've really, whose shows I have stood upon, who have been really inspirational to me and who've provided me with the support and the confidence to uh, do this work. And you know, dealing with abused and neglected children is difficult work, we all know that. So to be around for 30, 40 years, you must be a marathon runner. You must be able to deal with the crisis, but also reflect on what's happening and continue. And uh, one of the most important things is to share knowledge, share information, particularly with the next generation of individuals. So we wanna really bring this discussion to this issue. I'm focusing on a specific time frame. Uh, from, from the early 1970s to uh, the mid-1990s because that's the time frame of which I operated in, and I'm one of the pioneers because the program that I developed and worked on was the first one in the country in a pediatric hospital. Um, Children's National Medical Center received a grant and from that point um, it was extremely important to make sure that we not only learn how and what to do, but also to recognize the need to share that with others. So in today's busy environment, sometimes we don't always pay homage to the people who have done the work. Now, I wanna have a disclaimer that I may not have captured everybody. Um, there may be others, so we could talk about that. Um, I'm primarily addressing those people who have impacted very closely in the national scene as we were developing uh, APSAC, as we were working with various um, research projects, uh, as we were looking at how and where to disseminate this information, and to the national media. The media was very, very involved uh, for a long period of time because um, that's how we began to see some of this work get expanded. But the overarching goal, as I said, is to stimulate dialogue and to really celebrate and look at uh, individuals who may not even be here anymore. We started this uh, path when we were looking at Black History Month, and this was the opportunity, really, to talk about history, to talk about um, pioneers, to talk about practitioners, scholars, researchers, and uh, really to begin to have a conversation because 
oftentimes when you uh, are looking at websites today, sometimes they may not be well recognized, but they were household words in the field at the time uh, that we were setting up many of the dynamics, something as simple as interviewing children. Um, that all grew out of a practice mode that really moved into a research mode as they began to measure how do you interview children? What developmental factors do you take in consideration? And how do you and when do you uh, acquire information from a child who's been a victim? Um, and at the beginning, we did not know. Um, I've been in the field long enough, even in physical abuse, where when a mother brought a child into the emergency room and uh, said the child turned on the hot water to scald themselves and they have third degree burns over much of their body, um, we did not even know, could a two-year-old turn on a faucet? How does a two-year-old know how to turn on a faucet? And so in the very early days, we actually went to homes and to look, and we actually saw, can a young child do some of the things that the parents said they did? And in many cases, we find out that they could not. They could not developmentally do that. Um, and that began to lead us to practice and to repeating and then to research, to measure it, so that when we talk about these various uh, issues, whether it's physical abuse or sexual abuse, we have some evidence behind it. So I'm going to share with you the wonderful people who were there in the beginning, as I've called it, particularly for sexual abuse. Um, there's a lot of history about child maltreatment that I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to hear from the, from the very basic battered child syndrome to where we are today. But I'm going to talk about um, Dr. Frederick Green, uh, Gloria Johnson Powell. These people are no longer with us, but I want to share their work and their impact of their lives on me. Gail Wyatt, Carl Bell, Janet Hutchinson, Herschel Swinger, Marilyn Benoit, Dr. Benoit, Bob Hanton, and John Holton. Um, they were all instrumental in, and there's many more. There are many more change makers that joined us. But I'm gonna begin with Dr. Frederick Green because he was my mentor. He allowed me the opportunity to um, move from a clinic practicing nurse to an individual who is known on the national and international arena. Frederick Green had a long history and life and advocacy for children. He's a pediatrician and he was just, he just was a wonderful person. And he spent a lot of time um, just opening doors for me, allowing me to learn how to publish, uh, learn how to write grants. These are all survival things that if you don't know how to do them, um, you're not going to be able to fund whatever it is that you say you want to do. Um, in 1971, he served as the Associate Chief of the Children's Bureau. So he came from a federal model. Uh, when I first met Dr. Green, I, I, I have to say this, I didn't want a job. Um, everybody kept saying, do you know Dr. Green? Do you know Dr. Green? I'm like, no. And they said, well, he's renowned. And I said, well, I don't know him. Um, so they said, well, you just have to meet him. And, um, and he just had the most charming personality. And um, he talked me into a job that I didn't even, I wouldn't even go in to seek. And uh, he showed me what he was trying to do. He was at the head of the Office of Child Health Advocacy at Children's Hospital. And he believed in advocacy. You know, we may call it activism today, but he believed in advocacy. He believed that there are people who do not have a voice, that we must serve as a voice for people who are unable to speak for themselves, children, people with special needs, and certainly individuals who have been victimized. So that was his background. Um, he's a pediatrician by training, and um, he really was very instrumental in writing with his staff the very, very first child sexual abuse federal grant that was done by the Children's Bureau um, and given to Children's Hospital. There was another grant also 
offered that year, which was in Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. But it was certainly um, this particular model in a pediatric hospital that led many pediatric hospitals all over the country to try to replicate multidisciplinary teams. Um, how do you interview? What do you do? That's the cutting edge beginning of how this field was moving forward. Dr. Green and I were, he allowed me to do many, many things that were um, disseminating information throughout the country. So we had developed a series of conferences. Um, it actually was the first national child sexual abuse conference that we did at Children's Hospital. It was very labor intensive because we were on call, we were seeing clients, we were writing um, procedures and policies, and then we had a conference. And those of you who are involved in conference planning, you know, that's just enough all on its own. Um, but we found that each year it got bigger and bigger and bigger. It got larger primarily because there were so many uh, interested professionals around the country that needed to know that. So this is, this is what Dr. Green's contribution was. He, was. he was a genius at what he did. Gloria Johnson Powell. Gloria was a dear, dear friend. She has deceased. Um, she's a psychiatrist by training. And she was involved in much of the civil rights movement. So she came to us with a large background of really dealing with injustices throughout the country. Uh, she was a professor of child psychiatry at UCLA, but she was also the first tenured professor at Harvard University Medical Center. Um, as an African-American female, um, it, was a, it was a daunting role. There are many stories that she shared with me. She had a very unique sense of humor um, because whenever I would complain or make any kind of gestures that things were uh, difficult, she would say, uh, Joyce, let's look at what things are working. At the same time, she recognized that it was very hard to try to talk about victimization, to try to manage all of the things that needed to get done, and at the same time, have people appreciate your own uh, ability to be there. She was an author of many, many books, um, and uh, many, many opportunities came to her in terms she worked with, with others. Uh, she was a very kind and soft-spoken psychiatrist, and a lot of her work um, influenced a number of physicians, really, or psychiatrists throughout the country, one of them being, I believe it was uh, David Corwin, that she was um, introduced to this subject and provided David uh, with the opportunity to uh, work in this field as a specialist in child sexual abuse. This was in the early, early days, um, very, very late 1970s, early 1980s. Gloria worked with Gail Wyatt. Gail is just a fabulous writer. Gail and I just spoke a couple of days ago. She uh, informed me that we, uh, we had a, a virtual party uh, about two Saturdays ago, bringing together individuals from APSAC and CAPSAC to talk about the, the, the large number of people who really struggled in the early days to define um, these issues that we talk about so loosely. And Gail shared with me her role as an African-American scholar. Um, she's a, she was a brilliant woman, had written so many works, and she's still operating today. So she um, talked to me the other day. She said, I couldn't come to the virtual party, but I did see the tape, and I heard you mention my name, and I appreciate that. And um, again, people want to be recognized. It's not anything uh, more than anyone else who has put in their time. As you can see, she's published extensively, and she's written some books that really um, are still on the market today. Some of them are, are, are not. I think that first book, Sexual Abuse um, and Consensual Sex, I don't believe that's still in publication, but Stolen Woman is. And she really talked about African-American women 
and she really focused uh, very heavily on the, um, the conflicts that exist, how the literature and the research and the science never ever captured what it was like being an African-American woman who was a victim of any kind of sexual abuse or any kind of assault. Um, she spoke to that in terms of relationships. She also dealt with this whole notion of sexual harassment before it became a popular word. And um, people didn't believe it. It was too amorphous um, to recognize. Well, what are you calling harassment? Um, much of that is defined in her book, The Stolen Woman. And she really talks about the complexities of being uh, a victim of sexual assault and a victim particularly of having a history of victimization within your own context of your um, identification and culture. The Lasting Effects is almost like an encyclopedia, and she wrote that book along with Gail, along with Gloria Johnson Powell. They look very strongly at the developmental factors um, because sometimes people would think if the kids didn't talk about abuse, that it would go away, that it didn't happen. Um, but she pointed out the long-term effects, and we are seeing that now as we look at the ACEs studies. We see it now as we look at uh, adults who have histories of victimization. Um, and the studies that have really showed us scientifically how incidents of adverse childhood experiences, such as abuse and neglect, can affect a person throughout their lifespan. But they not only talked about it from the, the negative side, but she talked a lot about resilience and prevention and ways to help us say terrible things have happened, but what can we do about it now? Um, we are now really, the research is now really catching up with that in terms of the kinds of studies that are being done today because it really helps us uh, understand that we can't look too overgeneralizing about a problem. We have to really take it apart bit by bit in order to have the information that we really want to treat and monitor and try to look at outcomes. So the pioneers that, as I am defining them, are the people who were just on the cutting edge and looking at their work and where we are today, I could see miles of change, um, the, the, the sophistication of the research, the sensitivity, the role of the federal government even, because there, was, there is times now, if you don't even discuss this issue, if you're writing a proposal, you won't get funded, because we know it affects large numbers of people, and um, money is scarce, and so we can't just have a little laboratory of neat little things in a bowl uh, we have to really look at some of the hard stuff. And this was the beginning of really looking at the hard stuff and, and studying it too as well. Gail today, I just spoke with her a couple of days ago and she said it was really, really hard being a researcher and a scholar, an African-American woman in a large medical center. Um, and she was still wearing the realities of that today. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning because we talk about cumulative effects. Um, it does really take a long time. And you probably never get over some of the traumas that you, own, you, you experience, but it's certainly worthwhile to recognize that um, there's a lot that can be done. The next person is a very dear friend, and I was myself shocked and disappointed that we lost Carl so early. Dr. Carl Bell was a maverick. Um, he also was a psychiatrist. He practiced in Chicago. But he was the one who really spent a lot of time connecting the dots between looking at issues of violence and moving us to think about the community. Where does all this come from? And he recognized that these are very complex issues, and so you can't find one answer to a complex issue. You have to have many opportunities to look at different parts of the problem and different solutions that could be gained. Dr. 
Dr. Bell was in uh, Chicago at the Community Mental Health Council. Um, he also was very, very uh, available in the media, and he was somewhat controversial. He talked a lot about black-on-black -black crime before we even understood what it meant. Not in a derogatory way, but really to look at the trauma, early trauma. He talked about head injuries, head injuries that little black boys, um, and his population was similar to mine in Washington, D.C., where we had very large African-American populations. So we saw these things, and as we were seeing them, and we looked at what was in the literature, we saw there was a gap. So in that way, you had to really, in the early days, learn how to produce things that could be written, so that could be sustained, so that the history can be carried forward. And it's very hard to do this from a clinical level. It's somewhat um, more available in an academic setting, but in a clinical setting where you have clients and you have emergencies and you have staffing. Um, but it, we, we all understood back in those days that we had to. We had to make sure that we left some mark that this, this was occurring. And Carl, he, he was a man of many hats. Um, he, he informed the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, he was on many, many television shows. He was in numerous magazines, Popular Magazine, Essence Magazine, People Magazine. Uh, he and I were definitely uh, many times on the media set for a number of years because uh, everybody needed to know uh, what was going on. I think one time he was, he was, he and I were on the Today Show, um, and again, he is speaking from the clinical, psychiatric, diagnostic uh, perspective, and most of the time, as a nurse, I am looking at the patient and where that patient is coming from, that home, that community, that environment. So we had many of really extensive conversations um, and uh, unfortunately, we lost Carl a couple of years ago. Um, and so, but we always have to pay tribute to his work. Dr. Jan Hutchinson, it seems like I hung out with more psychiatrists than I did uh, nurses back in those days because there were so many questions. There were so many questions and there were so many unanswered issues in terms of what we were seeing, how we were seeing it. Jan Hutchinson is also a psychiatrist. She actually worked at Howard University. She um, was from Chicago also and uh, came to Washington, D.C. She was looking at the early evidence of victimized children, particularly African-American children, in the child welfare system that went just from the child welfare system to the juvenile justice system, and from the juvenile justice system to the criminal justice system. And uh, she was able to track data over long periods of time to really inform us that we have to begin to look how to, how to interrupt this pattern. Uh, and we're still trying to figure it out today, in, in a, as a matter of fact. We see a number, a large number of abused children who uh, end up in the foster care system uh, and they languish in the foster care system back in those days. Uh, things have improved and right now, currently, I have um, working with the child welfare system in the District of Columbia. It's an amazing experience for me, and I've been doing it actually for the last 10 years within the context of my uh, nonprofit organization in DC. And again, it's really looking at how these very large institutions, um, the bureaucratic aspect, how they can just chew and chew and chew on the, on the people who are just really coming in for service and not having an opportunity at all to really respond to anything. Um, Janet was extremely uh, sensitive to this and, and she is called a history maker because uh, she also had a style that was very laid back but very cutting edge smart um, and really brought out the things that needed to be said. She worked a lot with children with special needs. She focused very much on uh, the, the medical and the psychiatric needs of children, particularly those children who may or may not have had, um, you know, prenatal care or kids who really were born with certain deficits. How do you move them forward? Where's the positive? How do you establish resiliency? 
And she was using those terms and also had some wonderful meetings that were held at uh, Howard University at the Historical uh, Black College and began to see how we can connect with those universities. And we're still working on many aspects of that. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Spelman College and um, I was just amazed at these young women. Uh, and they, they were so enthusiastic and so motivated um, to do this work. And I think as for me, as I'm, I won't say I'm getting older, I am old. <laughs> But I'm, I'm still functioning, and I feel great. I have a great family, a fabulous husband, and my granddaughter is here, which I'm really happy to see, because um, this is her first time hearing me actually speak publicly. But our job is to, to, to let the next generation do the work and to hold their hands so that they can do it. And so I am currently uh, mentoring actually four uh, young women, and it's kind of a lot because I'm on the Zoom all the time. But um, I, I was very impressed. One is, one is a social worker, um, two are nurses, and the other is a psychologist. And they have a passion. They have a passion for this work. And I think we need to transfer that passion because those of us who have been doing this, this is the only thing that will sustain you is your passion. But you can't do it forever. Um, so I am just very blessed to have those young women in my life right now. And they ask a lot of questions. And I try to advise them that your career belongs to you. Uh, and that's what Jan Hutchinson did for me. Um, she spent a lot of time and um, took me behind the scenes on how she does the diagnostic work. And then I was able to interpret that and bring that to the community. Because sometimes you can't get everybody in the community. And when I see Herschel Swing, I always say, my man because he was the person in Los Angeles who really set the tone for helping us look at, the, at, at fathers. You know, fathers never get an opportunity in many, many settings. And in the early days of healthcare, it was always the maternal and child, which was the mother and the child. But we know that fathers play a tremendous role in the development of children and in the support of the family and the opportunities to help that family sustain and grow. Um, Herschel was a psychologist. He was a very busy person. He was just all over the place. Uh, he had all the counseling services. Um, he, one of the things he did that was extremely important uh, is he worked for an um, institute in Los Angeles that was focusing on children. Uh, he became a regional director, and he began to start out understanding what low-income communities, Watts communities, and other sections of Los Angeles, and beginning to focus on how he can get the community involved and fathers in particular. And he really kind of predated that whole fathers movement. Um, he was employed at Children's Institute International, which was another uh, partner of our agency. And they put out just reams of work um, they were involved in huge child abuse cases and child sexual abuse cases. And uh, some of you may know the history of uh, the McMartin case, which occurred um, in Los Angeles in, in a daycare. Um, and this is the kind of things that was involved with, and there's so many other people who were there with Herschel, but Herschel really set the tone um, and, and he was just in demand all the time. So the Project Fatherhood, and it still exists today. So this is really what's so important, is legacy. Um, something like APSAC, when we sat around and talked informally about bringing professionals together, um, here I'm able, blessed to see 35 years later, it's still functioning and surviving. And, um, and this, it's not easy because funding is really uh, a big factor in, in people surviving in programs. But, um, currently, I'm working with the National Partnership to End Interpersonal Violence. Uh, and, and I'm constantly looking at ways, how can we keep the funding going? Because this is an organization in which we know that violence across the lifespan affects every age group, even into elders who are abused. So we start out with pioneers, and we start out with something that looks simple, and we just watch it grow and expand. 
And that's why you're here today at this conference, and I hope that you'll take advantage of all the opportunities and the workshops and the programs. Um, you won't be sorry. My dear friend, Dr. Marilyn Benoit, she was a, a psychiatrist at Children's Hospital. Um, she is still currently practicing today. She it was um, involved in so many aspects uh, with the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, she served on many medical boards. She was at Devereux Psychiatric, a private psychiatric institution. Um, she was a clinical professor at Georgetown, and she had numerous um, national task force and councils. And one of the advantages that we've had being in Washington, D.C., um, is we were right at the seat of the federal government. And as the field was growing, so was the federal government, so was legislation. And many of us who were in those early days, uh, and even today, uh, were constantly serving as a resource for policy development, a resource for programs, curriculum, training, uh, which spread throughout the country. Um, and it's, it is a lot of voices that went sat, sat at the table. And one of the things that we always talked about was to make sure that there was a person of color sitting at the table when those policies are being talked about and discussed. And that wasn't always possible because there was so few. There were so few by just virtual numbers um, who had acquired the uh, attention to that level. Marilyn, just again, a prolific writer. Um, she lives in uh, Annapolis, Maryland today. I spoke with Mar uh, Marilyn a couple of days ago, and um, she was busy, 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 and she said, Joyce, you just tell them for me. Uh, and she's still in, in, um, is teaching, she's still lecturing, and I believe she did serve as a consultant to ABSAC, um, the foundling in New York, and gave a talk on psychiatric work and the needs of children particularly looking at early intervention and early um, kinds of services. Bob Hampton, we used to call him the godfather of uh, child abuse. He was a sociologist, um, but he also had worked in many, many areas. He worked with Eli Neuberger uh, in Chicago, um, in Chicago, in Boston, excuse me. Um, he was the president of York College. He served with me for many years uh, as a steering committee member on um, the Institute on Domestic Violence in the African American community. As we looked at one form of abuse, we recognized there were many forms of abuse. And certainly the element of looking at domestic violence, for a period of time, the domestic violence community and the child abuse community were on opposite ends of the continuum. Today, almost everybody recognized you can't help the child until you help their parents. And so you are looking at uh, a person who did that hard research. And he did it on the national level to allow for people to understand. And one of the things that he uh, focused on very heavily, he was a, he was a member uh, of the uh, National Research Council, which was in DC, National Academy, um, looking at understanding child abuse. Uh, again, this is uh, a book that has been out for many, many years, but it really serves as a stepping stone from where we first say we have a problem to, okay, what do we do about the problem? Okay, this is what we're currently doing. How much do we know about that problem? And how can we study it to know it even more? And this is where we are today. We're at the studying it to do more level. But you can't really study to do more unless you understand where we have come from because it was very, very crude at, at many times. Um, and we had to make sure. Uh, those of us who have had to serve as expert witnesses in a court of law, you know, you may think you know something until you are an expert witness uh, until they begin to say, well, how did you get there? How do you make that happen? And you have to be able to connect the dots. And this early work um, that was done by many, many scholars um, from all 
ethnic groups and all generations allowed us to really understand what we had to do and it serves pretty much as a guide today as we continue to move forward. Moving forward is really the key because without it, we will not be able to really grapple with this issue. I'm almost impressed with this whole um, gun violence situation. Um, and one would say that what, what happened to those young children in Texas was the worst, the worst form of child abuse. Um, it hasn't been said that way, but it's the worst form because it was, it was fatal. And so and it was preventable and it was fatal. Um, so that's why our knowledge, we need to be there to make those statements and back it up with the accuracy of information that's factual, that could be at least challenged, but it's factual based on empirical identification and looking at issues. Last but not least on my list is a wonderful person named John Holton. And John is still practicing today. Um, the reason I felt that John was such uh, an important aspect was he helped us look at the cost of child abuse before we could even say, well, how much does it really cost when a child is abused? What is the elements related to, what do we measure? Because that was the only way we felt that we were gonna get the attention that this issue deserved on Capitol Hill, because you have to talk money. Um, and um, he, did, he was instrumental in that. He was really at the um, Prevent Child Abuse of America, which used to be called the National Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse. Uh, he worked with a number of esteemed researchers in that institution um, and has done this work for many, many years. And he is currently, he actually sat in. I did a presentation like this uh, a couple of months ago, and I hadn't talked to John in about 40 years. And um, he actually called me up and was just stunned that I was thinking of him in these terms. But, uh, and he's still um, functioning as a psychologist in the field and doing this work uh, to remember where we came from and what we had to do. John Halton really did that early study, as I mentioned, to prevent, uh, to really look at the financial cost of child abuse. And he did a lot of estimates and a lot of cost factors. He looked at what it would cost for a child in foster care, what the medical and mental health services were. Um, but again, it was the element of cost only talks about those things where money actually transferred. As we look at early childhood experiences over a lifetime, we probably will not be able to get an accurate cost. But he did do the instrumental work necessary for the Center for Disease Control to begin to quantify and to begin to acknowledge that there are major financial issues related to child maltreatment from all aspects. Um, and he was instrumental in that, and particularly looking, again, at the law enforcement system. So I've really kind of gone through about 10 pioneers who were very instrumental. I knew all of these individuals personally. There are a number of people that I would love to mention, um, but it was a little more difficult to, um, I didn't want to change the theme because then I'd really leave people out. But certainly we have um, Dr. Sharon Cooper, who um, is just amazing. Um, she is a, she's a physician, practicing physician, and she's done a lot of consulting on these issues of missing and exploited children. Um, trafficking of young children, sexual assault. And I recall being in one of her sessions as she was just looking at celebrity children and some of the aspects of how they were marketed and how that marketing set them up for all forms of victimization. Um, she's an incredible person. I actually spoke with her a couple of days ago as well. And I wanted to mention her because I didn't alter my presentation to add her. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge that she has been uh, an extremely valuable person in the field. So again, I want to thank 
ABSAC, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, um, and being, having an opportunity really to serve on the Commission of Racial Justice and Child Maltreatment, and to begin to have dialogue and discussions about this issue in a way that will allow us to move forward. Um, and we were honoring them and celebrating them, um, but we also need to celebrate ourselves because uh, this is not an easy topic. And there are many, many people who have contributed across all of the uh, groups of professionals. And establishing the Institute uh, at ABSAC really provides a consistent over a period of time so that we are learning from each other because sometimes we may or may not have the accurate information that we need, but we need to really look at the scholarly work and then look at the community and then look at individuals and then look at systems. And as we do this work, um, we will play justice and certainly be able to move forward to improve the lives of children uh, throughout the country. Um, that's my hope, and I hope that's my legacy. Thank you. I am. I, I've lost track of the time. No, I, we're good. Oh. Not, we have 30 minutes. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Good, good, good. So I think one of the things that would be helpful is to address some questions as it relates to some of the things in the five years that she presented. Obviously, we have had a greater discussion on uh, some of the impact on the child welfare system uh, with Dr. Ortega and myself. But we're, does anyone want to start with questions? I'm really feeling this need to move the field forward, and you did such a nice job of showing how these people moved it forward and set everything up for us to be where we are today. And you know, everything is so discouraging right now. I'm wondering where you see the hope in terms of all of this work and the work we're currently doing to move the field forward. And not only the field, but, but, but the, the way children are treated in this world. Well. I am an eternal optimist, and I really, but I also am a very critical person. People who know me know that if, if it gets past me, I mean, if there's something that's shaky, I'm going to bring it up. Um, I do see the field moving forward. I think that there's a lot of changes that are occurring in the child welfare system. Um, it's not a perfect system, but I do see that the whole notion of moving toward child well-being. And, and it's, so, it's so amorphous because you're like, what does that mean, child well-being? But so you have to break it down so you can really talk about, you know, the educational functioning of children, the developmental needs, their healthcare needs. Um, currently, I'm working with a group of uh, individuals in the District of Columbia who are on the citizen review panel. And um, this is where citizens, and they, they are citizens, but they are also specialists in fields of child maltreatment. Um, some of our, our guardian ad litem attorneys, and these are mostly African-American, but not all, because it's not about race at this point. We, we have to look at different pieces. I see the system really taking a hard look at prevention, the big P prevention. I mean, for years and years, you couldn't even say prevention in child welfare because the way the funding was leveled you had to have a problem, you know, and so they either named something haphazardly as a problem to get the funding. That's, that's not a good idea. But I do see the field moving toward child well-being, really looking at prevention, measuring prevention. Prevention is tough, and we know that it's tough because even with something like the COVID vaccine, you know, where we know if you do this and this and this, you can prevent it we had pushback. So you're going to get pushback and you just have to be strong. And I do see people coming behind me who have, who are gutsy and, and they're out there. I mean, there have been so many atrocities, um, so many injustices. Um, and if you find and see a young person or maybe not so young person and they have the energy to, to take that message forward, support them, listen to them because they may be on the cutting edge of something. 
Uh, we don't know how things develop, but it's just going to take people. So um, I'm very, I'm very optimistic. I mean, I am. I've been in the field. I've retired. I've re-retired. I still run um, an organization in the District of Columbia, um, and I'm busy. People want to know. They want to know. And if you're available to provide accurate, clear, helpful information that they could see work, then it's a positive thing. I've worked with homeless women, and um, for me, uh, they come in, they're angry, they've been abused, they have no place to live, and, and we're talking about their relationship with their child. Um, by the end of the period of time, they said, you know, I asked them, what did you learn? And they learned so much. So we all have a lot to give. Just give it. Um, it doesn't even cost anything most of the time. So one of the things um, that you touched on, Joyce, that I think is important maybe to say out loud, a little louder and clearer, is the notion of how you all connected because I'm sure many times you all were the only person of color in a room with other professionals. And I think that that's something that as a person of color I understand, but I don't think other people who are not of color or professionals in a field that has very few professionals of color, even though many clients are of color, if you could talk a little bit about that and how you all knew to connect or what you did to connect. Well. There's, there's several ways to address it. First of all, there were so few. Um, when I was hired at Children's Hospital, I believe um, they interviewed all the disciplines. They didn't know which discipline was going to produce the kind of person that could lead this new effort. It was a new effort in child sexual abuse, and everyone was saying, um, how do you stand doing that work? So you have to have a, a sense of understanding of the work and, the, and be able to function on that level. But once you have identified um, the things that need to be done, many times, uh, at least at Children's, we had conferences. We brought people together. And we were specifically bringing people together for the purpose of connecting, networking, the same as anyone else. Um, and oftentimes, when you go and you see another person who looks like you, uh, there's a certain amount of expectations to say, hello, how are you? Where are you from? Where, what are you doing? And I think that still exists today. I think we've gotten a little more shy about it. Um, but it, it used to be an expectation. Even if you walk down the street in a strange town or you're getting on a plane, if you see somebody that looks like you, Generally, you speak and say hello. Uh, there's many stories behind that because a little child might say, I, I think my husband used to tell me this a lot about his daughter because he would, from that era, and he would say, um, you know, hello to somebody that he didn't know. And the little kid, his daughter would say, oh, did you know that person? Why are you talking to them? You know, uh, and, and he had to try to explain because we give him two messages, you know, don't talk to strangers. And yet he's talking to a stranger, and, and so there's a bonding that goes on. Um, also, you, you really can link with like minds, and that's what we did. And it's the same way you and I have, have met, you know, through professional arenas and through conversation and um, through understanding values that are similar. Um, it, it, it's really the process is, is no different. I don't know how other people would speak to that, but... Um, I think it's an important aspect of how do you make this happen, um, but that's one way. You tell me how do you make it happen. How do you connect? Over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> or a meeting in Washington, D.C., because they were calling together people who were beginning to work on problems about sexual abuse. And this was in the early 80s. And I remember 
Assistant Attorney General of the United States. And we went to, into her office and talked about pulling together this interdisciplinary field. And she arranged for us to receive $15,000 from the National Institute of Justice to help fund the National Summit Conference on Diagnosing Child Sexual Abuse, from which came a strong call to pull this field together. And Joyce asked 2,000 people in New Orleans in 1986 if it was time, and everybody raised their hand. Yes, it, it's a process of being in the right place at the right time. And I, I must say, back in those early days, finding money was a lot easier. <laughs> Um, it, it was, um, there was just a hunger for information. And if you presented with uh, an understanding of how to address something, there was support was, was there. Lois Harrington went on to become the Attorney General and she's, uh, then she became a judge in, in California. But she, another person who um, just opened so many doors, um, we were at the, um, um, FBI agency down in Quantico looking at how some of the social justice issues before we even talked about social justice. So it is a process of connecting and being a leader. I speak a lot about leadership because I think that there are room for quality leadership for people who can articulate what the problems are and begin to engage other people and bring them along. Um, so that's my own, you know, style is to really say that, you know, you too can do it. So I think that that uh, has worked best for me. Right. Yeah, and there is no question about your, your leadership and your willingness to have difficult conversations. I think it's the only way to express it. It's, it can be a difficult conversation, but recognizing ultimately our leaders, we think about our leaders, I know, I know, there's, there's so many. I mean, if I think of all my students, but Sandy, oh, my heart. Uh, so, <laughs> it's an honor. I thank you for your pioneering work and for this incredible history that you shared, for everything that you continue to shout and make us um, recognize this can't be an afterthought. We've talked before about cultural and diversity is often seen as an afterthought. So I want to just personally thank you for helping us try to kind of the next generation not have it be an afterthought, have us be shouting it as loud as you have, carrying on that legacy. But I'm, I'm curious, you talked about connecting the dots, um, and I'm wondering, what do, you, what do you see now as kind of one of those areas that still isn't connected as well as it should be? You talked about domestic violence and child, and child abuse and parent, helping parents and helping children. But is there a particular area in this particular day and age that you see that's still not connected as well as it should be? Well, I would like to see better parent parenting. Um, I think that that's the core issue, and it's not, there's no magic bullet and no simple process to get us there. But I'm looking at all of the carnage that's going on with young people, and sometimes you can lose sight of the fact that young people are the most productive, um, and they need guidance, and they need wisdom. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of parents who do an amazing job, but it's a hard job. Um, I think that um, the work we're doing at the partnership, I'm very committed to. Uh, we're working on trying to not trying to, but we're doing it, it's not easy, 
public awareness so that every single citizen could understand, not at an academic level, not like they're going to do some research, but to understand how this, how what happens here is going to affect what's going on there. And so as we talk about gun violence and, you know, then there's the fight of taking away the guns and not taking away the guns. It's a complex issue. And life is a complex issue. So that's what I see us trying to move more toward those elements so that we can, we don't have to have a simple hammer for every nail. We have to understand there are different kinds of nails, you know, and there are different kinds of hammers. Um, that's what I would see us moving forward. And it's, and it's an on and on thing, you know, it's never going to be perfect, but we need to really move it along. Parenting is the key. If parents, and it's so hard, I mean, I t teach parenting even today on Zoom, um, and I'm, I'm always amazed at how people come in so, I won't say hostile, but so upset because they don't have resources, they don't have the, and so there's a lot of don't haves, but they do have a child. And so you have to really help them see, and in certain areas, in certain ways, it's, it's harder than others, but I think, I, I'm still wondering, you know, these parents that are buying guns for 18 year olds, what is going on? I'll never know, because they'll never tell me, but I do see us really, the general public should understand about trauma and trauma informed problems. The institutions, even that healthcare center of which there was a shooting, um, some of the approaches made things worse. You have to understand that some people have gone through trauma. And rather than say there's something wrong with them, we, we need to ask, well, what happened? We need to have the dialogue. Um, so I'm, I'm, again, very optimistic, but I, I, it's a big, tall order. Uh, my mother had nine children, so I had to learn how to take care of my brothers and sisters, and fortunately, it allowed me to learn how to, to do other things. I have three uh, adult daughters and fabulous granddaughters. I, I, I want to make her stand up because she looks so good to me up from up here. Stand up, Cal. This, if there is such a thing as a wonderful, perfect young woman, but I, you know, from the time Kelly was born, she was a little tiny little baby. You know, you can almost hold her in one hand. Um, and her mom has done an amazing job. Um, she's in college and um, she's the one that comes over and helps me do so many things. She's just aware. She's aware of the environment and I'm not going to embarrass her by having her say anything, but parenting, parenting and grandparenting and families is the foundation of all the things that we see go wrong. And we can't fix them after they are so far gone. But to answer your question, that's why I would put my eggs into parenting. And, and I wouldn't just call it parenting because the people would just think that hey, everybody knows how to parent. But I would call it relationship building. I would call it interacting with young people. I would call it learning how to have self-care for yourself, um, learning how to acknowledge your deficits um, and, and, and promote your strength. I mean, there's so much more to it. Um, and we find that when we look at many, many families where there's maltreatment, um, these things are missing. And we're not blaming them, but they're missing. And so that's why I come to uh, the partnership and, and talk on these things because I've done it. And uh, you know, I've gone into the jails and, and people are just, just rampant with anger, the things that have happened to them. But they forget their children and we can't forget the children. It's painful. Any other questions? Yes. Not a question, but a comment. Um, just to feed off what you just said about parents and grandparents. When I was growing up, you know, we had grandparents. The village. Village. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not, the village is not really there anymore. So, you know, parents are struggling to raise the children, and I have an additional help that we had, you know, when we were growing up. That also causes a lot of issues too. It, it does, but 
again, it's reaching out. I mean, that happened to me. Well, I lived in California for many, many years. I moved to the East Coast um, because of my husband's job at that time. So I just had myself and my two children. I eventually had a third child when I was on the East Coast. Um, but I recruited all my neighbors. I really did. And they're still just close to me as siblings today, you know, because they picked up um, Robin from the daycare. Um, they taught Robin how to drive. Um, you, you can't do everything. And that's the message I give a lot of young parents. You can't do everything yourself. So you have to really look around and establish that village. And it's not the same, but it may be better. You know, friends are chosen family. So you don't have to say this one's better than the other one, but they're there for you. They have your back. And that's the most important thing. But that message doesn't get across too much because people tend to, you know, go inward and they have their own kind of uh, emotional things. But I am just as much a parent to my nieces as I am to my children and my grandchildren. So when you have a lot to give, um, or when you've received a lot, which, which I have, because my parents were very strong, um, I have no problem of reaching out. When I get tired, I just say, I'm tired. I told you, I'm tired. <laughs> so they can hear that and step, step away. Ah, she's tired. But um, that's, that was my message. You're right. We see so many isolated young people. Um, but be there for them. And then they will be there for someone else. So before I ask you other questions, if there are other questions, I want to make sure you all get your questions answered. Okay. Um, so I thank you so much for this presentation. I learned so much. Um, so I'm really grateful. Thank you. Um, thank you for the years and years of service that you've done. Uh, That's, that's a very good question. I think we've all suffered from the pandemic, um, you know, and with the, the fear of, of violence, you almost don't want to leave your house anymore. Um, a lot of people feel that way, and I know I get really comfortable at home, and so getting out is not as easy. This is the first time I've been on a plane. I'm like, ah, all these people. Um, so you have to kind of re retool. Um, there are people looking at that issue, and they're looking at it um, particularly in the African-American community where the COVID vi virus was just rampant. We have a number of children who are in the foster care system because they lost both their parents to the virus. Um, and so they're just beginning to look at, the again, the long-term effects. We're not long enough out of it because we're still in. Some of us are wearing masks, some of us are not. Um, because there's still so much unknown. Um, I, and I, when I had my second COVID shot, I almost lost my arm. I could not believe it, you know, and I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty gutsy and I'm like, okay, give me a shot. My arm, literally, I got the COVID arm and from here to here was like third degree burns. I mean, it was just incredible. So I went to the doctors, the doctors didn't know what to do. Oh, they were taking pictures and, and just looking at it. Um, and it was overwhelming. And I think that the COVID virus was just beginning to try to understand, you know, the impact. Kids' reading levels have gone way down. Kids' ability to cope. Um, there's, a, there's a little advertisement on TV that, that kind of makes me chuckle. And it's about this family trying to um, go to the airport. And this little boy, about seven years old, and he's carrying bags and boxes and the one has a mask on, the other ones don't. And it, it, was, it was designed to say there's a different way of getting your luggage to, to, the, um, to the airport. But this little kid said, I don't want to deal with this anymore, Dad. 
And a lot of kids feel that way. They really just feel like they can't take any more. Um, and so we have to just observe what the effects have been. But we do have to study it because it's going to, it's going to be something even 20 years from now when we're not even thinking about it that's going to show how the, the knowledge dip has changed and, and how even the forms of abuse um, have, have increased even though they weren't getting reported because of the COVID. So th there's so much unknowns that I wouldn't, I wouldn't think of trying to put a quick answer to that but to acknowledge that what you're saying is crucial, that we shouldn't just push it under the rug because we know certain communities suffered more. We know all communities where the virus was prevalent. We also saw the damage to public health. There was a lot of damage to public health. I mean, when I went to the School of Public Health at the University of California in Berkeley, um, you know, we were told that you know, there's no such thing as a public health emergency. You have time to think, you do some epidemiology, you figure out what the problem is. You know, it's not like the busy emergency room. Well, I have learned that public health has really taken a, a, a step back and um, I don't know where that's gonna go. That's, that's for people to, to talk about. But I think we have to look at the impact of COVID um, as it exists right now and as it will affect us in the years to come in terms of interaction. Um, the, getting kids out of school. I mean, my daughter with the young children in school, she was just frantic. You know, you're trying to teach Zoom on a, uh, for a kindergartner. You know, at the same time, you have your own work to do. At the same time, the, the electronics are not working. Um, and people were losing it. And we're, we're dealing with that now. You can't see that there's no expression, so they don't know when you're, you know, that they can't, they just can't read your face, um, and we're we're all suffering through that right now. Um, it's it's very it's very alarming, but we're here, so that's the piece. We're here, we know it's a problem, so now we have to figure it out, and, and the way to figure out things is to see how somebody else feels about it and then see what the literature is saying, and, and really look, and begin to get involved in public policy. Public policy belongs to all of us. It's not a political issue. You know, and, and, and speaking about policies, as, as I do in this uh, webinar that we talk about from the partnership, um, everybody has a stake in the game. Just as we talk about climate control, we have to talk about public policy. And that means that, because that's where monies are gonna go. And if it's for years and years, we've always assumed that all the money should go into the urban cities. Um, but then we find the rural communities uh, are having tremendous deficits. Uh, and then we're seeing a lot of crime and problems in those communities as well. So the game is not over. This is just one little slice of it. And that COVID, if I never see it again, I'll be very happy. Yeah, you have to be a marathon runner. Really, I'm serious. You have to have a balance to your life. And I just remember uh, many times being asked this question by the media, how do you deal with this all the time? You know, and I speak of balance. Um, I'm just not allowed to have a crisis at home. <laughs> so when something needs to be fixed, you know, I, like, I don't like things that are broken. Like if something needs to be fixed, like, well, let me get it fixed because we can't be having a crisis worrying about that. And it doesn't mean that, we, that I don't worry or that I don't get concerned about things, but I do try to surround myself. Um, I didn't introduce my husband, but I, I am going to embarrass him and introduce him because he is a legend in his field. He, is, uh, he was the dean of the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland. He was a full colonel in the United States Army. And he is my rock because um, he allows me to be me. 
and he's retired and he doesn't fuss if I'm on Zoom, you know, I said, I got a Zoom call, okay. Um, so you need to find a way in life to make things work for you. It may not work for other people, but you do have to do that. And balance is really the key. Not easy to get, but it is the key. So please join me in thanking again Joyce Thomas for her wonderful presentation. Thank you.